Hey everyone, welcome to Barter Hordes. My name is Robert, and today is our very first episode in the Essential Novels series. Today I'll be discussing Edith Wharton's 1905 novel, The House of Mirth, and I'll show you a quick picture here of the scratch-off chart we're using from Pop Chart Lab, which shows all 100 novels, and the first one is now scratched off. We'll be scratching off one of those each time we do a new novel in the series. Let's get right into the book. Edith Newbold Jones was born during the American Civil War into a wealthy, long-established New York family. Despite publishing a variety of poems and translations by the age of 18, Edith was subjected to the negative pressures of society, which encouraged her to marry young instead of dedicating her energy to literature. At the age of 23, Edith thus married Edward Wharton, although she never found in him an artistic and intellectual equal, and later divorced him after nearly 30 years of marriage. In the meantime, Edith Wharton proved a highly prolific and successful writer, establishing her reputation as one of the most important literary figures of the period. Among the 40 volumes of work she published during her lifetime, she's best known for her novella Ethan Frome, 1911, and novels such as The House of Mirth, 1905, and The Age of Innocence, 1920, for which she received the first Pulitzer Prize ever awarded to a woman which depict the life of New York's high society with vivid realism and irony. Throughout her life, Edith Wharton formed part of the intellectual and artistic circles of the time and also devoted her energy to international affairs. During World War I, she set up various programs in support of the French war effort, for which she was later appointed Chevalier of the Legion of Honor, France's highest award. After the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865, the United States experienced rapid economic growth in the North and the West, while the South remained economically devastated and plagued by racist violence. This period, known as the Gilded Age, 1870 to 1900, allowed the U.S. to establish its position as the world's dominant economic, industrial, and agricultural power. At the same time, rapid industrialization also brought inequality to unprecedented heights. As most of the wealth became concentrated in the hands of the rich, the working class, largely composed of millions of poor immigrants from Europe, was forced to live in squalid conditions. The following decades, known as the Progressive Era, 1890s to the 1920s, saw a rise in political activism aimed at fighting poverty and making politics more democratic. The first wave of feminism culminated and ended during this period, as in 1920, the 19th Amendment gave white women the right to vote. The Progressive Era also impacted America's international relations. In 1917, moved by a belief in bringing democracy to the world, Despite widespread public opposition, President Woodrow Wilson decided to enter World War I, 1914 to 1918, which allowed the Allied powers to win the war. Wharton's The House of Mirth, 1905, and later The Age of Innocence, 1920, belong to a category of novels known as the novel of manners, aiming to describe the conventions, habits, and ideology of a given society in all of its complexity, the novel of manners usually presents one character's efforts to fight against restrictive rules and traditions with varying degrees of success. As in The House of Mirth, this often involves a woman's effort to find freedom in constrictive domestic and public spheres. British novelists Jane Austen and William Thackeray American writer Henry James and French writer Honoré de Balzac are considered notable writers of this genre. At the root of this novelistic tradition lie the literary movements of realism and naturalism, which aim to represent reality faithfully 
with quasi-scientific precision and detachment. French naturalist, author Emile Zola, in particular, is known for depicting his characters as victims of their fate, condemned to following the cruel rules of their social world. Despite her success as a writer, Edith Wharton considered her skills in design and architecture to be one of her most important gifts. At the age of 25, she co-authored the non-fiction book The Decoration of Houses, 1897, which became surprisingly successful. She later designed her own estate, The Mount, in Lenox, Massachusetts, and impressed by the result, concluded that she was a better landscape gardener than novelist. Edith Wharton had a strained relationship with her mother, who tried to stifle the young girl's early efforts at literary composition, even prohibiting her from reading novels before marriage. At the age of 11, Edith showed her mother a short story she had written, which began with a woman complaining about having to tidy the drawing room for a guest. She later described her mother's reaction, Never shall I forget the sudden drop of my creative frenzy when my mother returned it with the icy comment, Drawing rooms are always tidy. Let's focus on four big ideas in The House of Mirth. This novel explores the rewards and dangers of living in New York's high society. Lily Bart, a young woman of moderate means, wants to secure her position among the rich upper crust. Convinced that her main purpose in life is to live in luxury and dazzle the people around her with her beauty, she strives to marry a rich man and secure her wealth. However, plagued by reckless spending habits and an inability to secure a stable source of income, Lily soon finds herself in serious financial troubles. Over time, Lily's economic difficulties lead her to reconsider her entire conception of life. She realizes that her pursuit of material comforts has led her to neglect a much more important aspect of her life, her personal happiness. Through Lily's descent into poverty, the House of Mirth ultimately shows that while money might bring transient pleasures, luxury and materialism alone do not bring happiness. Rather, happiness depends on an individual's internal strength, which can come to light in any set of material circumstances. Fascinated by the power and comfort that money brings, Lily believes that money will make her happy in life. For much of the novel, it appears that money does indeed make her happy, as the young woman thrives in elegant environments, deriving a sense of power, excitement, and amusement from what money brings. Lily's ambition consists of becoming rich and powerful. Lily believes that being poor, what she calls dinginess or living like pigs, is a form of moral dishonor that she must avoid at all costs. Paradoxically, though, her attitude derives less from actual wealth, since her means are low, than from the conviction that spending money is a noble activity. As a result, Lily's desire to integrate into upper-class society leads her to spend more money than she actually possesses. I am horribly poor and very expensive, she tells her friend Lawrence Selden, revealing a central paradox in her attitude toward money. Despite the obvious risks that this extravagant lifestyle entails, as Lily does not have a stable source of income to justify her extravagant purchases, she is used to instability and the constant possibility of financial ruin. All her life, Lily has seen money go out as quickly as it came in, and whatever theories she cultivated as to the prudence of setting aside a part of her gains, she had unhappily no saving vision of the risks of the opposite course. Instead of seeing her inability to save money as a crucial defect, Lily considers her mode of life heroic, filled with danger and instability perhaps, but also with a sense of adventure. Lily proves ready to sacrifice economic stability in favor of glamour and excitement. However, on a more unconscious level, Lily also realizes that she's unwilling to sacrifice her own future for the sake of money alone. Indeed, despite Lily's professed desire to marry someone rich, her actual behavior reveals the very opposite. 
On several occasions, Lily fails to take advantage of the opportunities that arise for her to marry rich men, such as Percy Grice, George Dorset, and Sim Rosedale, who are attracted to her and would gladly marry her, but whose personalities she finds immensely boring. The novel states, she would not indeed have cared to marry a man who was merely rich. She was secretly ashamed of her mother's crude passion for money. This attitude puts Lily in an impossible bind, wanting to live an extravagant, materialistic life without being ready to make the necessary concessions, like marrying a rich man she does not love, to sustain it. Lily puts herself in an untenable situation in which it becomes apparent that she'll soon have to decide which kind of life she truly wants, one in which she sacrifices the possibility of marrying for love and happiness or one in which she sacrifices her desire to belong to high society. Life ultimately makes that choice for her. When Lily realizes that what she believed to be an honest business deal with Gus Trenner is nothing but a subterfuge, Lily suddenly finds herself plagued with debt and an inability to sustain her expensive ambitions. As a result, she's forced to join the lowest ranks of society. In this context, the only way for Lily to regain control of her life and achieve a sense of satisfaction is to accept that a less glamorous lifestyle does not equal moral degradation. Lily is forced to re-examine her views about poverty when she joins working class life. At first, she views poverty as moral failing. To Miss Bart, as to her mother, acquiescence in dinginess was evidence of stupidity and there were moments when she almost felt that other girls were plain and inferior from choice. Since Lily's downfall is not actually the result of stupidity or choice, but rather the product of an unfortunate series of circumstances, Lily's forced to accept that poverty is not a sign of moral deficiency or intellectual inferiority. This mode of thinking crystallizes when Lily meets Nettie Struther, a young woman who has worked hard to recover from illness and achieve economic stability. Lily soon feels inspired by Nettie's energy and optimism and realizes that being poor is not a disgrace. It was no longer from the vision of material poverty that she turned with the greatest shrinking. She had a sense of deeper impoverishment, of an inner destitution compared to which outward conditions dwindled into insignificance. Undergoing a moral illumination, Lily redefines the very concept of poverty, concluding that true poverty relates to internal life, a poverty of the mind, not to external circumstances. This thought has the potential to allow Lily to begin her life anew, free from the self-imposed pressure to constantly achieve higher wealth. Although Lily soon dies of an overdose of a sleeping medicine, this moment serves as a beacon of hope in Lily's life, proving to her that happiness can emerge in any set of material conditions and that, like Nettie, she too can find the inner strength to overcome her circumstances. The second big idea is the opposition between morality and hypocrisy. In 20th century New York high society, people's social fortunes are determined by their social reputation. Like so many other members and aspirers of the upper class, Lily Bart follows the rules of the game and takes part in deceit and manipulation to secure her social standing. However, when Lily herself suffers from defamation and is then given the opportunity to take revenge on her enemy, Bertha Dorset, through blackmail, Lily's forced to confront the moral validity of her actions. She has to decide whether she's willing to sacrifice her moral principles in favor of the social codes of high society, according to which blackmail is an effective and therefore acceptable means to preserve her reputation or whether she will give up on her ambitions for social power in order to defend her integrity, according to which blackmail is an immoral act. In the end, Lily makes a choice that will define her entire life, to side with truth and justice, and give up on her dreams of social and material comfort. Lily's decision, which highlights the moral deprivation of high society, 
proves that individual uprightness is infinitely more valuable than the pressure to conform to society's degraded norms of behavior. In the high society of which Lily Bart aspires to be a member, people do not hesitate to defend their reputations through lies and deception. Too eager to become part of this world, Lily is initially willing to participate in manipulation to obtain the power or money she desires. While Lily does not actively seek to harm others, she does engage in social manipulation of her own. In her effort to marry a rich man, Lily is ready to lie about her true self. When she tries to seduce Percy Grice, a rich, boring man with Puritan values, Lily pretends to be someone she's not, a conservative woman who attends church regularly and has never gambled or smoked cigarettes. The fact that Lily is actively duping her potential future husband does not strike her as inherently wrong, since she considers it a logical step in her social game. Believing that her end goal, money and power, is a noble ambition, she does not bother to dwell on the moral validity of her actions, although she does feel averse to sacrificing her own happiness for money alone. This attitude is reflective of a general environment in which truth matters less than public appearances. What is truth? Where a woman is concerned, it's the story that's easiest to believe, Lily cynically tells her friend Gertie Farish. Lily has experienced such hypocrisy herself, after her friend, Bertha, invented a lie accusing Lily of trying to seduce Bertha's husband, George, to detract public attention from the accusations of adultery that Bertha herself faces. Even though most people know that Bertha is lying and that Lily is innocent, Bertha's accusation condemns Lily to social isolation since Bertha has a powerful social credit that Lily sorely lacks. Money. Truth and justice are thus considered irrelevant in a world where people's wealth determines their public credibility. Although Lily accepts that her social world does not follow traditional rules of justice, Lily herself retains moral values that keep her from harming people intentionally. Lily's actions also occasionally reveal her interest in helping others. Once, she surprises herself by giving money to Gertie Farish for charitable work even investing some of her time and energy by joining one of the charity's meetings. While Lily's motives aren't purely selfless, since she derives a sense of power and self-esteem from this action, she still discovers that an aspect of her personality is remotely interested in social justice. Lily felt a new interest in herself as a person of charitable instincts. She had never before thought of doing good with the wealth she had so often dreamed of possessing. Lily thus becomes aware of the possibility of thinking beyond her narrow desires and interests and of using her power to do good. In addition, Lily exhibits strong moral principles about repaying her debts. After she discovers that she's deeply indebted to Gus Trenner, she becomes convinced that she needs to find a way to pay him back, even though she lacks the means to do so. By the end of the novel, when Lily has lost so much money that she's condemned to a working class life, she remains committed to her moral principles and addresses a check of $9,000 to Gus, a decision that she knows will condemn her to financial ruin. This show of honesty reveals Lily's underlying moral principles, which keep her from accepting money for free. These conflicting aspects of Lily's behavior, her sometimes strong moral compass, coupled with her desire to do whatever it takes to secure her spot in high society, are put to a test at the end of the novel, when Lily has the opportunity to blackmail Bertha Dorset in order to re-enter high society. Lily's ultimate decision to refrain from immoral behavior reveals that she has taken a permanent stance. She will not engage in dubious moral acts for the sole purpose of social advancement. Rather, she prefers to remain an honest, upright person, even if this means giving up on her dreams. When Lily gains possession of letters that Bertha Dorset wrote to Lawrence Selden, with whom Bertha once had an adulterous affair, Lily has the opportunity of using these letters to blackmail Bertha. 
Lily even receives a promise from Sim Rosedale, a rich man who is attracted to her, that he will marry her if she succeeds in returning to high society, which would secure Lily's economic situation for the rest of her life. After contemplating her desperate situation and hesitating at length about what to do, Lily's finally struck by a moment of moral enlightenment and decides that she's not capable of blackmailing Bertha. Instead, she decides to burn Bertha's letters so that she'll never again be tempted to use them for her own advancement. This decision condemns Lily to poverty and social isolation, but elevates her on a moral and spiritual level. As Lily understands that justice and self-worth are more important than social and economic advancement, she denounces the degradation of high society arguing that it should be rejected in favor of greater ideals. Lily's decision is morally inspiring, revealing the importance of investing in moral integrity instead of social advancement. The third big idea at play in this novel is gender, class, and freedom. As a young unmarried woman in 20th century New York high society, Lily Bart is forced to abide by a series of rules regulating her sexual and social behavior. In this context, in which she constantly needs to protect her reputation from potential accusations of impropriety, Lily feels that she can never be free. At the same time, Lily can't conceive of life outside of the restrictions of high society and finds herself bending to prevailing norms and habits instead of trying to build an independent life of her own. Over the course of the novel, she becomes increasingly frustrated by this double bind. Her simultaneous desire to be economically free by joining high society and socially free by rejecting high society's norms. Lily's death tragically resolves this issue as it finally severs her from all social obligations. Her death serves both as a symbol and a warning, highlighting the importance of cultivating one's spiritual, social, and economic independence against the suffocating pressures of society before it's too late. In conversations with her friends Lawrence Selden and Gertie Farish, who do not belong to the same level of high society as Lily. Lily often denounces the way life as an upper-class woman restricts her freedom. Part of Lily's lack of freedom derives from her unmarried status, which forces her to maintain an appearance of sexual purity. Lily frequently complains about the injustice of double standards regarding the sexual behaviors of women and men, or married and unmarried women. For example, she denounces the fact that unmarried women are condemned for going alone to a man's apartment, whereas men never suffer from such accusations of sexual promiscuity. A married woman, too, is free to visit single men as long as her husband shows approval or indifference to her actions. So Lily must learn to navigate a rigid social world in which, paradoxically, her only means to achieve freedom is to marry. The pressure to marry also impacts the financial cost of being a woman in high society. To Lawrence, Lily criticizes the fact that women have to spend their money on elegant fashion. Your coat's a little shabby, but who cares? It doesn't keep people from asking you to dine. If I were shabby, no one would have me. A woman is asked out as much for her clothes as for herself. We are expected to be pretty and well-dressed till we drop, and if we can't keep it up alone, we have to go into partnership. Socially and economically, women are forced to bear pressures that limit the possibility to build a life on their own. However, even though Lily understands that being part of high society necessarily restricts her freedom, her desire to live among the very rich forces her to abide by these social conventions. She was beginning to have fits of angry rebellion against fate when she longed to drop out of the race and make an independent life for herself. But what manner of life would it be? Anytime Lily considers abandoning the obligations that society places on her, she's forced to accept that she's not yet willing to break away from the luxuries and power it provides. Beyond external constraints, Lily is also constrained from within 
as social conditioning has kept her from developing original thoughts and conceiving of an independent way of life that would respect her feelings and emotions. Many of Lily's views about high society are the direct product of her upbringing, and in particular, of her mother's example. Throughout her life, Mrs. Bart convinced Lily of the need to keep away from dinginess and to constantly thrive for greater wealth and power. This upbringing has exerted a deep influence on Lily, who finds herself tied down to a narrow conception of life without being intellectually able to explore alternative lifestyles. Lily's friend Lawrence Selden explains, she was so evidently the victim of the civilization which had produced her that the links of her bracelet seemed like manacles chaining her to her fate. Lily's personal ambition for wealth is a product of social conditioning that keeps her from developing her individuality. Lily's lack of freedom is thus external as much as internal, and her awareness of this fact only heightens the tragedy of it. Although she admires Selden for his capacity to ignore the rules of high society, she finds herself unable to imitate his behavior. Lawrence had preserved a certain social detachment, a happy air of viewing the show objectively, of having points of contact outside the great gilt cage in which they were all huddled for the mob to gape at. How alluring the world outside the cage appeared to Lily as she heard its door clang on her. In reality, as she knew, the door never clanged. It stood always open, but most of the captives were like flies in a bottle, and having once flown in, could never regain their freedom. Lily knows that she could choose another way of life, but she also knows that something in her, something as invisible as a glass bottle, prevents her from doing it. Incapable of picturing her life outside the cage of high society, Lily's forced to relinquish her independence of spirit to the force of habit. As a result, Lily lives her life unthinkingly and unfeelingly, as though she were incapable of true emotion. When had Lily ever really felt or pitied or understood? All she wanted was the taste of new experiences. She seemed like some cruel creature experimenting in a laboratory. Lily's abidance by a life of superficial pursuits, such as buying expensive clothes, has kept her from developing personal freedom the freedom to explore the world beyond the artificial laboratory of high society. Paradoxically, Lily's only escape from the constraints of society takes place in death. Through an overdose of a sleeping medication that remains highly ambiguous, as it is impossible to ascertain whether it's accidental or self-inflicted, Lily finally finds peace from society's constraining laws. This tragic ending reveals the difficulty of achieving freedom in a life so heavily regimented by social obligations. It also suggests that lack of social and economic independence can lead to desperate behavior. True freedom, the novel concludes, is a spiritual quest, one that must be cultivated separately from the artifices of civilized life. Otherwise, without it, the burden of society might be too much to bear. And the fourth big topic at play in the House of Mirth is the idea of love and friendship. In 20th century New York's high society, Lily Bart belongs to a social world in which friendships are constantly limited by self-interest. In the same way that people use her for social advancement, Lily uses her so-called friends to enhance her own prestige and financial resources. However, as Lily becomes better acquainted with people such as Gertie Farish and Lawrence Selden, who do not belong to the same circle that she wants to join, she realizes that the friendships she has experienced in the upper crust are superficial and dissatisfying. By contrast, the affection Lily receives from Gertie and Lawrence has not only brought her unconditional support, but has also contributed to shaping her character inspiring her to become a better, more honest person. Over time, Lily concludes that, as high society corrupts relationships, the only way to build sincere, intimate relationships is to escape hierarchies of power. This also involves making herself vulnerable, not only to receiving the support and care she needs in her most desperate moments, 
but also to becoming the honest person she has always known she could be. In the competitive, potentially vicious world of high society, friendship is limited to ties of power and money, as people use each other to achieve greater social prestige. Lily, who's committed to remaining part of this social sphere, seems bound to live a life deprived of sincere affection. Following the example of her peers, Lily organizes her friends according to a utilitarian classification based on who is more or less likely to support her in the advent of trouble. However, the difficulty of taking into account other people's own thirst for power makes such relationships fraught with instability and danger. For example, when Lily asks Gus Trenner to invest her money on the stock market for her, she manipulates him by making him think that they share a special relationship. In turn, though, Gus believes that helping Lily financially will allow him to ask for sexual favors from her, an assumption that later puts Lily in a dangerous position as she has to preserve her reputation and her honor against Gus's advances. The two characters' beliefs that they can use each other for their own self-interest reveals that such friendships are nothing more than a form of transaction aimed at asserting power. Lily's descent into poverty forces her to re-examine her life and her relationships as she realizes that true friendship can only exist outside of relations of power. After Bertha Dorset spread slanderous lies about Lily, the divorcee Carrie Fisher is the only person who initially shows Lily affection. Over the course of months, she helps Lily befriend the wealthy Sam and Maddie Gormer and finds her a job with Mrs. Hatch, a rich woman in need of a social secretary, and later with Madame Regina, the hat maker. However, when Mrs. Hatch is involved in a scandal, Carrie fears becoming connected to that scandal and cuts ties with Lily, indicating that her own reputation is more important than her devotion to her friend. It's only once Lily becomes better acquainted with Gertie Farish, who is not part of high society, that she discovers what true friendship involves. Gertie, who has no reputation to defend, places little value on Lily's social or financial status. In delicate social and financial situations, Lily realizes that the only person she can turn to is Gertie, since her high society friends would not be willing to help her without receiving anything in return. As Lily's increasing financial troubles force her to give up on her previous friendships, she realizes that true friendship and love not only helps people in life, but also serves to define who one is or can become. Through love, Lily finally gets in touch with her true self. The only people who have always trusted in Lily's goodness are Gertie Farish and Lawrence Selden. These two characters believe that beneath all of Lily's social artifice lies the real Lily, who's capable of noble sentiments and of honoring values greater than materialism. However, for most of the novel, it remains ambiguous whether or not this real Lily actually exists, since Lily herself often ignores her true feelings in her quest for money and power. By the end of the novel, though, she admits to Lawrence, who has always loved her and with whom she too is in love, that she has kept the Lily Bart you knew with her throughout her life, adding that the knowledge of Lawrence's love has always helped me. Lily admits that Lawrence's affection has not only given her comfort in difficult times, but has also impacted her character, reminding her that she could be more than a self-interested member of high society. Lily's views about the impact of love on one's sense of self coalesce when she meets Nettie Struther, a woman who Lily once helped through Gertie's charity. Seeing the way Nettie has fought against poverty with the support of her husband, Lily becomes convinced that it had taken two to build the nest, the man's faith as well as the woman's courage. Her husband's faith in her had made her renewal possible. Applying this thought to herself, Lily becomes aware that she too could hope to thrive through Lawrence's love. Lily concludes that true love elevates human beings, magnifying their goodness and allowing them to connect with each other in a way that makes both sides stronger. 
Therefore, it's only once Lily escapes the suffocating world of high society that she understands that her worth as a human being is based as much on her own actions as on the quality of her relationships with other people. Lily becomes convinced that love can reveal to vulnerable human beings what their true potential is, and perhaps, over time, help them realize it. Against an ideology of individuality, the novel shows that people's capacity to connect with each other on an intimate level reveals their deepest, noblest humanity. Okay, there you have the first installment of our Essential Novels series. As always, I'll try to keep you informed of the next three novels so you can acquire copies before we get to them. The next novel in our series is Saul Bellow's 1953 novel, The Adventures of Augie March, and I'll be using the Penguin Classics edition for that one. The novel after that goes back to the beginning of the American experience with the novel, and that's Herman Melville's novel, Moby Dick. The third novel from now will be going back all the way to the beginning of the Western novel itself, the very first book on our scratch-off chart, and that is Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote. And I will be using the Edith Grossman translation if I can find my copy. It must be in one of the boxes of books that I have not yet unpacked. Uh, if not, I'll be getting a new copy. But that's what we'll be doing three books from now. For the Saul Bellow book, I'll be posting the video on August 30th. So you have just over two weeks to finish up that book before I do my discussion. I'll be back again on Wednesday with the next in the short story series. And for this series, I'll see you again on August 30th.